Hello, everybody. It's good to be able to greet you in the name of the Lord again today and to come again to study with you the great events in the Old Testament. Um, this will be um, episode number 27, and uh, I'll have uh, an announcement about the next uh, uh, season at the end of this lesson. Let's talk with the Lord. God, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, for the uh, elect electronic means of the modern age for a communication like this. But most of all, Father, we thank you that you've revealed yourself to us, that you have uh, put in place a system of redemption to bring us back to you when we've sinned, and you've given to us the answer to the sin problem in your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray to you in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, the last time we were together, the last lesson, we uh, talked about the Ten Commandments. and We tried to give a pretty good delineation of what each of those uh, Ten Commandments were, what they involved, and uh, the fact that they were the basis for the uh, Law of Moses, as they are also the background basis for the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Ten Commandments, as we noticed at that time, are the principles of the Almighty God in his person. Uh, he is integ uh, his integrity is founded all through the Ten Commandments. And uh, while he did use those pre uh, precepts and concepts to uh, be the base for the Law of Moses, uh, you can find these same principles uh, distributed throughout the New Testament, but particularly in the fourth, uh, the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters of Matthew, which is the Sermon on the Mount of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now today I want to talk to with you for a little while about after the Ten Commandments. Uh, there is no way that we can include the rest of the Old Testament in this particular uh, lesson and uh, episode, but we do want to uh, bring these lessons to an end today on a high note with uh, the fact that we have put in place what is the foundation of God's eternal purpose which the Apostle Paul tells us he accomplished uh, uh, in Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, that's in Ephesians 6, uh, 3 and 11. And so we want to talk a little bit about what happened next after the Ten Commandments were given. Well, we noticed before we left last time what happened next was the people of Israel, the Israelites were terrified at what they had seen. And we ended the session last time with looking at the 12th chapter of Hebrews, where there is a comparison made between what happened at the Mount Sinai and the terror that was uh, there that terrified the people uh, coming to Mount Sinai, and then uh, compared and contrasted with uh, the coming to Mount Zion, uh, that is, coming to Jesus Christ and the New Covenant, where everything is different and everything is peace and calm and eternal salvation is offered to us from the grace of God by the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so then what did happen immediately after that in uh, the Ten Commandments and the, uh, the reaction? Well, what happened next was the first application of the uh, laws based upon the Ten Commandments. That begins in chapter 20 and in verse 22. The ten basic context, uh, concepts that God puts in place uh, is used for God's purposes to state the laws that we now know uh, as the law of Moses. There were specific laws, specific applications, and they begin immediately at the end of uh, the reaction to the Ten Commandments. Now, God continues to add to the requirements for the Jewish people, the Israelites, uh, all through the Old Testament. And uh, it is a long reach from uh, here where we have all of the foundational things that are necessary for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham through Abraham's descendants and through his one descendant, Jesus Christ, uh, to bring an, an end to the domination of Satan of, our, of the lives of human beings. But today we just want to uh, look at how we got to this point and what is next, and summarize some things that will leave us in a good stead to go on 
the next time we would probably come to studies in the Old Testament uh, such as this. The uh, first commandments of rules based upon the ten concepts uh, are basic regu regulations for the people of God immediately after they are now assembled before God in law and ready to seal the covenant with him, which they do uh, here in these chapters in Exodus. The uh, Ten Commandments would not be anything practical unless God would interpret them in meaningful statements of commands and requirements that would work itself into the law that he gave through Moses. And so meaningful statements of specific rules to govern his people are immediately begun uh, when the Ten Commandments are given. The first individual laws that we see beginning in chapter 20 and verse 22 are generally known among scholars as the uh, Book of Covenant, or the, the Covenant Book of, Book of the Covenant, excuse me, and uh, they are not the entirety of the laws, but they are the basic relationship and agreement between God and the children of Israel through Moses, and so it becomes the Book uh, of the Covenant. The, the individual statements are, as we saw last time, the Ten Commandments are often referred to as the Decalogue. The Israelites referred to them as the Ten Words of God. They constitute uh, the foundation for all the other laws of the Torah, that is, uh, the Old Testament, or the five books of Moses, which is known as the Pentateuch. And the key points of emphasis in these immediate passages, beginning in chapter 20 and verse 22, are, have to do with the nature of God, with, the human, with human rights, uh, how that they are to have the rights under the, under the commandments of the Ten. Uh, social justice is established at the very outset. Uh, loyalty on the part of Israel and uh, the covenant and the promises. But to be more specific, specific uh, when we go on through into chapter 21, we have a listing of at least uh, seven things that are elaborations of the basic concepts of the Ten Commandments. There is a regulation for Hebrew servants or slaves in chapter 21, verses 1 through 32. Then we have also the uh, requirements for uh, redressing personal injury, liability, Personal, uh, the pro uh, protection of personal property is included in these uh, first commandments in chapter 21. A uh, social responsibility of how each individual person uh, living under the Ten Commandments are to act within their lives before God and with fellow uh, Israelites. And that's in chapter uh, 22 and verse 16. Then there are the laws of justice and mercy, a quite uh, expanse of, of laws that are listed there. They get more specific and more uh, widened out and expanded in the book of Leviticus, which is known as really uh, the, uh, ex the great expansion of the commands of God under the law. Then there are the laws about the Sabbath day in chapter 23. And we have the promise of God that his angel will prepare the way for them as they move out from Sinai uh, into the Sinai Peninsula and toward the land of Canaan, which is known as the land of promise. The promised land that was promised to Abraham uh, in Genesis chapter 12 and again in Genesis chapter 23. And so the um, thing that they do as they move out now is to go forth to get ready to make the law of Moses workable and to make it a place of worship and to establish a, a particular place where the presence of God will come down to meet them. That would be called the tabernacle. And so the official inauguration of the covenant uh, comes forth in chapter 24, and we see that happening beginning in verse uh, uh, 18 of the 24th chapter. Um, the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the mountain and wait there. This is verse 12, actually. That I may give you the tables of stone with, with the law and the commandments, which I have written for their instruction. The law and the commandments would be the elaborations known as the book of the covenant. 
So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and uh, uh, Moses went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and, and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now, now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. And there is where there is compounded between God and Moses the basic agreements that we know as the covenant of the law of Moses. Now then, when he comes back down, he has also received the instructions of how to build the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a movable feast, so to speak. Uh, it is more of a tent than it is a building, but it is a very elaborate tent with several coverings, all of them signifying something very specific. Uh, the, off, uh, the tabernacle is the place where God will come down and his presence will come into the inner portion known as the holy, most holy place. The outer portion will be the holy place where the priests will minister at the candelabra and at the showbread and, uh, be, and come forth from the slaughtering of the animals to be offered on the altar of sacrifice, which is at, just outside uh, the entry uh, to the holy place. Then there is a curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place, and no one is to go in there except once a year the high priest will take an offering in his hand, and he will go into the most holy place and offer the offerings of the Day of Atonement. God's presence will sit upon what is known under the cherubim on the altar, uh, the mercy seat. And this will figure prominently in the New Covenant as well when we come to uh, study the book of Hebrews and apply the Leviticus uh, statements about God and his mercy seat, and that will be uh, according to the uh, propitiating of the wrath of God, where he makes all things right between humans uh, and himself. But that's far off from this moment in time in the Sinai Peninsula Desert. The offerings for uh, all kinds of offerings will be offered at their tabernacle. Uh, they are to build it in a certain dimension, in a certain length and width and height, they are to build it out of the, uh, specific kinds of materials. They are to surround it with a collapsible wall that they would take down, and as they move from one place to another, they will also deconstruct the temple or the tabernacle. And the uh, Levites, the uh, tribe of Levi, will be the ministers that will carry those parts of the tabernacle and the wall and the burnt offering uh, altar uh, throughout the days that they will wander in the wilderness for 40 years. The practical significance of the tabernacle is that this is the place where God will meet the children of Israel. Now it's not a place where all of them will gather together as in the assembly of a huge church building. It is very, very small in comparison to most church buildings today and to, uh, certainly to the temples uh, and to the cathedrals all over Europe and some in the United States. But the, it is a place where God's presence, His Spirit, will come to dwell uh, under the cherubim on the uh, uh, altar of, 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 uh, of forgiveness where the mercy seat is and where God will accept the offerings that have been offered on the altar of sacrifice outside the tent and the burning of the candelabras and the offerings of blood inside the most holy place as uh, the high priest sprinkles it upon the place uh, where God's presence is, uh, is indeed uh, assembled. The practical significance of the temple is that it is the place of daily communication between Moses and the high priest, his brother Aaron, and the priesthood as they work the uh, services of the tabernacle 
and God himself. Uh, it will be the contact point between God and his people uh, throughout their sojourn in the Sinai Peninsula Desert. Uh, it will also be in place uh, and when they go across the Jordan River to take possession of the land of Canaan. It will remain in place as the uh, tabernacle will be the place where God meets his people until in the day of David and Solomon, a temple will be built in Jerusalem. It will be larger than the, than the tabernacle, but it will not be a huge thing as we might think of as one of the cathedrals in the world today. But the eternal, but the influence and the significance of the tabernacle is that it is the place where God's presence will meet with God's people through their representative, Moses first, and then the high priest through the centuries that follow as the law of Moses unfolds and is lived out and transpires. There are some eternal aspects to the tabernacle. The offerings of blood are eternal and eternalized in the offering of Jesus Christ. The uh, uh, candles that were burned on the candelabra are uh, uh, transferred by meaning into the prayers of the saints. We have the holy bread that will be a, a replication of the uh, Lord's Supper in the New Covenant. And uh, we have the, uh, the Book of the Covenant that will be represented by the New Testament in the New Testament days. Uh, the tabernacle is like all the rest of the Old Testament. It is a foreshadowing of things that are to come that will fulfill everything in the Old Testament from the 12th chapter of Genesis to the end of it. So we need to observe and remember that the Old Testament material is always moving towards something. It never is static, and this is the end of God's uh, work with humanity and the end of his revelation, but no. Everything in the Old Testament, everything that God gives in the relationship with the children of Israel is moving forward to a time when the, the Messiah will come, fulfill the law exactly, offer the sinless blood of a, of a sinless life for sacrifice as the Lamb of God, and then uh, it will uh, then end uh, in the uh, resurrection of Jesus and the establishment of the new covenant in the church on the day of Pentecost as recorded uh, in the second chapter of the book of Acts. And so when we come to this point, we have everything in place now that will be needed for the law of Moses to function for 15 centuries. For the next 1,500 years, the children of Israel will live under the law of Moses. Now, they will be a lot of trouble along the way, and 10 of those 12 tribes will, re, re, will be withdrawn, and they will then be captured by the, Assy the Assyrians in the Assyrian captivity, and they will disappear from history. The two tribes that are left, Judah and Benjamin, will live in the south around Jerusalem. They will be known as Judah, and they will also have 70 years of Babylonian captivity. But other than that 70 years, 15 centuries, they will uh, observe the ordinances and the commandments that are based upon the Ten Commandments of the, of the law of Moses. But it's uh, a perfect law. It is just to be kept by imperfect people. And so it is not perfect in the sense that it cannot take away sin, because human effort cannot satisfy the wrath of, that God has upon the unholiness of sin, which in this fallen world we all live in contact daily. He has a plan. He promised in Abraham in, Je in Genesis 12 that he would ultimately bring a descendant of Abraham into the world that would take away the sin of the world. Of course, we know that that is Jesus John the Baptist styled him as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So we move forward then after we have the tabernacle in place. It's very elaborate. We haven't gone into the elaboration and details. It would take us a month of Sundays to get through all of that. So I urge you to read Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers and Deuteronomy and get the whole foundational picture. But the basic foundation for the function of the law of Moses is now intact as we come to this particular point. We'll remember too 
that we are seeing things that are being dealt with by God with the descendants of Abraham. We must always remember when studying the Old Testament that when God deals with the children of Israel, he is dealing with the descendants of Abraham, Abraham whom God promised that the descendants would be as numberless as the sands upon the seashore or the stars in the sky, and that this nation that would come uh, as a union between Abraham and his wife Sarah would be a nation that would produce um, a, a, an individual descendant of Abraham who would bless all the nations of the earth. And we all know that that is fulfilled explicitly and completely in the uh, life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and the ascension back to heaven of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the descendants of Abraham are now a multitude of people. As I've mentioned before, the estimates are between uh, one million and six million of these children of Israel out there in the hot desert sun of the Sinai Peninsula. I tend to think of uh, the uh, more conservative number when we number the children of Israel to think about the logistics of moving six million people across that desert for food, water, and everything else is daunting. Of course, if God wanted it done, he could see that it was done. I choose to think that it may not have been quite as many as sometimes the estimate is. It may not have been as many as a six thousand, uh, as one thousand, or uh, as one million. But it was a huge number of people. The logistics would none the same be uh, very difficult to, uh, to fulfill. And so we move now in, in uh, immediate steps toward the promises of God that will ultimately, 15 centuries later, be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But God promised it. There is a song in our songbooks that we uh, don't sing as much as uh, in the olden days, but it's called Standing on the Promises of God. I know a preacher that uh, used to minister to a huge church in Dallas, Texas, that would have that, uh, uh, that hymn sung at almost every service. He took his stand on the promises of God. And standing on the promises of God, as the hymn says, I cannot fall, and I'm listening every moment to the Spirit's call, trusting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Abraham stood on the promises of God. He proved his fidelity when God ordered him to offer his son Isaac and went to the point of raising the knife to plunge it into his son's body. God stayed his hand, provided a sacrificial lamb uh, and uh, that David, that uh, Abraham offered, and then uh, the rest is history, as they say. God used Abraham to produce uh, descendants that would develop into a clan, that would develop into 12 tribes, that would develop into a huge number of people. God has taken them now into the Sinai Desert, and he has constituted them into a nation giving them a law based upon ten great concepts and giving them a law that he will expand uh, throughout the next 15 centuries and giving them certain things to accomplish so that they will be the, the, the vehicle through whom Messiah will come into the world when Jesus is born in, as the babe of Bethlehem. Now those are the quick steps that go forward from where we are right now. We're going to end these studies here today, but at some future time, the Lord willing that we live and move and have our being, uh, I may return to the uh, great events in the Old Testament, uh, beginning uh, with the conquest of Canaan. But this is where we'll end in a little while this afternoon. Uh, some important specifics that we need to have in mind as we come to this point in the great events of the Old Testament the movement toward the promised land. They will now begin to move toward the, the uh, land of Canaan, which is the land that uh, G God promised Abraham that his descendants would occupy as their homeland. Now, Abraham was living in that land when God made that promise. But you recall, we remember, that they uh, migrated into Egypt when the great famine that had been predicted came, 
and they went down and uh, uh, Jacob's son or Esrael's son Joseph was already there because he had been sold into slavery and he was the providential vehicle for God to bring them down there uh, they multiplied and they were enslaved by the uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians and then we've just studied how the plagues uh, caused them to be released and how they uh, crossed the Red Sea by miraculous power of God and came into the to the Sinai Desert where we now have them and gave to them what we have been discussing now about the Ten Commandments and the laws based upon them then they're going to move out into uh, a traversing of that uh, Sinai Desert uh, they will disobey God because they will not believe that uh, they can go into the land and take it when the spies come back that uh, Moses sends in to spy out the land and so he sentences, God sentences them to 40 years of wandering in the desert. And that 40 years is intended to see the death of every grown person that is among the Israelites when they refuse to obey God and cross the Jordan River and go in in the conquest of the land of Canaan. So when they do cross the Jordan River, the adult generation that came out of the Exodus have all died. And it's their children who now are going to go into the land of Canaan when they go in there uh, after Joshua becomes the leader of the people of Israel upon the death of Moses. And so this is a movement toward the promised land. As uh, God had promised to Abraham, they would go there. They are on their way, but they are going to have some disaster. And uh, it has been reiterated to the people of God through time that they must keep the covenant with God and when they fail to keep faith with him he causes them to wander uh, in the desert uh, for 40 years that is a fiasco that is tragic and it is uh, colossal that many people refusing to go into the land as God commands them and only two of the twelve spies uh, said that we can do this, Joshua and Caleb. Caleb said, we can do this by the power of God. But the majority of the people will not go. Moses cannot lead them there. And Moses does not get to lead them there. He will die at the uh, hand of God in a, in a merciful, loving way before they cross the Jordan River under the command of what I call General Joshua. Well, they... Um, the beginning toward the conquest uh, under Joshua uh, begins to take place in the book of Joshua that follows uh, uh, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. A lot of that material is uh, repetitious, but a lot of it is expanding on the law that God gave originally uh, to the children of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai, as we see in chapter 20 beginning. The progress of the uh, conquest, once they finally get across after the 40 years of wandering, uh, it's an interesting thing that Joshua does uh, when he uh, becomes the uh, leader of the children of Israel and how he uh, makes his arrangement with, uh, with God as the successor uh, to Moses. And God tells Joshua, I will be with you as I was with Moses. So they make preparation to go into the land and Joshua has a, an encounter with an angel that makes him to understand that he, he may be the general of the uh, uh, Israelite army but the commander is God through these angels so they go first into the vicinity of, of Jericho and they have great success overthrow the walls of Jericho and take it by storm and then later, uh, they come to take the town of Ai, or I, Ai, and because they are smug in their accomplishment thinking that they did it, they are beaten utterly in that particular battle. And so uh, that fiasco as well causes them to not uh, be able to go forward as quickly into the conquest uh, of the land of Canaan. But the sad thing is, is that 
though they get started and they go into the land and uh, conquer uh, it in toto in part, and the land is assigned to the 12 tribes of Israel, they never completely complete the conquest. And one of the tribes that of the Canaanites that they do not eradicate are the Philistines. And the Philistines uh, will be a thorn in the side of God's people throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. And uh, the uh, Philistine territory is generally speaking that part of, uh, of Israel today known as the Gaza Strip where there's been a great deal of fighting between the Palestinians and the Israelis for many, many well, several decades uh, since 1948. So the sequence of events that moves forward then from where we are that we perhaps will return to sometime later in the future God willing uh, it takes place in the sequence of a number of different books. The book that follows uh, Joshua is the book of Judges, where disaster after disaster befalls the children of Israel because they do not have a leader like Moses and Joshua, and they continue to, to digress from the will of God, go back into idolatry. God raises up a judge to lead them into uh, his presence and into safety again, and this is repeated over and over and over. We go through the historical books. Then following them is the prophets. I would like to uh, have the time, if my life is extended, to have some time in these podcasts to do a, a series of studies of some of the prophets. You know, they're so long, the major prophets are long. The 13 minor prophets are called minor because they're much shorter. But there are some mighty, wonderful blessings in the books of prophecy, and I hope that someday we might come back to that. But in the meantime, we need to do something else uh, for a time. We have deemed that now is the time. While we've set to the foundation for the uh, fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in place, then we will go to a different study uh, in the next season of these episodes. And so the uh, things that follow, the kingdom is established. It's a united kingdom when David and Solomon are kings, but it divides when uh, uh, Solomon's son becomes a king and Jeroboam and Rehoboam uh, have a great conflict and uh, the northern tribe is carried away by Jeroboam and they have eventually are over, overtaken, defeated, and assimilated with the people from Assyria. But then the two southern tribes have their own problems. There is a great reform by Josiah, the young king, but who is uh, soon killed in battle uh, from uh, on the battlefield. <clears throat> and they are carried into Babylonian captivity. And then we have the res restoration back to building the temple. And as I say, this Old Testament narrative is, uh, does not end with where we're stopping today. And, uh, and there, it is a great study, which we may do uh, sometime later. So the setting uh, for the progress toward God's plan for redeeming huma humanity is in place as we leave the narrative of the Old Testament where we are today. And it is a fulfillment that we call the New Testament or the New Covenant of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as I've said uh, with this episode now today, uh, we conclude this, uh, this series of studies in the great events of the Old Testament season, which is season two of the Travels with Bob, as uh, our brethren have, have styled these podcasts. This is not to say, as I've already indicated, that there are no more great events in the Old Testament beyond these that we have discussed. There certainly are many more great events in the Old Testament. However, of these 27 episodes that we have discussed together uh, in the last few months are, as I've said now repeatedly, the foundational events that bring us to the point where the remainder of the Old Testament is played out and uh, built upon uh, the uh, place of the tabernacle and later the temple the place where God meets the children of Israel. At this point, um, 
uh, bringing the narrative, the storyline of the Old Testament uh, to the founding and the organizing of the nation of Israel uh, upon the basic concepts of the Ten Commandments uh, and the application of the laws that we've just discussed based on these uh, commandments, we've gotten to the base of that upon which the remaining history of the Old Testament is structured. From here on, it'll always be a hearkening back to the Law of Moses and the Ten Commandments. For instance, from the first five books of the Old Testament, commonly referred to as the five books of Moses, God then reveals how he has guided and directed the descendants of Abraham. Always remember, we're dealing with the descendants of Abraham whom God made great promises to. In, his, in various activities, God deals with the descendants of Abraham, the children of Israel, in a number of activities, finally completing his promise to Abraham, uh, which we have recorded in Genesis chapter 12, specifically to bring a Savior uh, in the world, Messiah, who would uh, take away the power of Satan to kill us in sin before God. And so he would come into the world to keep the commandments in a life without sin, and would become the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, as John called him in, first, in John chapter 1, verses 26, 9 and 36. And he would become the human sacrifice that is necessary to lift the wrath of God from human sinners. And it is the marvelous grace of God in action when in the New Testament we see that promise of Abra to Abraham coming to its fruition and Christianity and the church coming into existence and into the gospel dispensation in which we are now living until Jesus comes again. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, as I've said, who will take away the sin of the world. The altar where the Lamb of God will be offered in sacrifice for sin is a Roman cross, as we all know that outside the city of Jerusalem. So, from where we have brought the series of studies now, and then on until the end of the Old Testament, there are many significant great events that unfold in the biblical narrative. However, everything from here to the end of the Old Testament is based upon this foundation that we have now come to in the narrative of the Old Testament up to this point. And these events in the remainder of the Old Testament are vitally important. I am not minimizing them at all. Please don't think that. But if we pause for a study of them and, and went on and to pursue them now, we would be repeating much of what we have already studied, and uh, we would be doing the Old Testament a year from now, probably, or longer. So it has been deemed that uh, this, this study that we've had is, is enough detail of the Old Testament for the present, and therefore, deeming it expedient to conclude the Old Testament studies that we've been doing with this uh, study today, and these foundational uh, uh, aspects of God bringing his people toward the eternal covenant and purpose with Jesus. In two or three weeks, we shall, God willing that we live, uh, continue our travels with Bob, and we will resume season with season three. At that time, we will study the great words of God, beginning with the study of God himself, the first, maybe uh, first two, at least the first one of, of those episodes. So please watch for the announcement in our church bulletin. Uh, in the screens in our assemblies on the Lord's Day and at other times when we meet uh, for the beginning of these studies, uh, which will take place uh, in uh, two or three weeks from now. Thank you for traveling with me these uh, 27 episodes in the studies of the great events in the Old Testament. I'm encouraged by many of you who have spoken to me about that, and I'm encouraged that you do uh, take the time to study these with me. I'm looking forward with great anticipation to the beginning of season three with you. And in the meantime, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless.